Another event, welcome to Abul Ahdan Laden. Thank you. And, and I think this is the second time to, to come to Minneapolis. Yes. It's and you don't, you, don't, you don't live very far from here, but no. that's nice. So how do you like the city so far? I like the city. There's so much that seems available in the art community, and there are many artists that are engaged with the community outside themselves. And so... Yeah, a lot of people say that about how important arts to Minneapolis and... Uh, but tell us a little bit about, you know, your reciting and, and that uh, Saved by Face and Verses uh, that night. And, 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 I, and I think uh, the varieties, as I said, uh, of artists and poets uh, and, and the topics and, uh, and, and reflection of people's experience and those things we don't see on the mainstream media at all and Fox and all of that. When we talk about the, the Somalia that people talk about in poetry or in their conversation, what Somalia are they talking about? So I think uh, the organizer, Nimo Hussein Ferra, was very mindful about trying to invite people that engage the oral culture, maybe that exclusively, and then people who were interested in documenting or archiving in a different way. And so there was a variety of storytellers. It was across ages. There was both male and female. And so I think that that gave an opportunity to have a wide voice and that people really responded to that because there was every kind of landscape, political, social, um, emotional, stories that were maybe closer to an individual experience and then also ideas that were for the entire nation and for the diaspora, you know, since so many of us are scattered all over the world. And also there was like uh, performance Yes. A performance poetry. There also was poetry recited by the Somali language. Yes. And, and it, so it's really, it wasn't about a specific genre or anything. It was no. just the experience altogether. Whatever it is, people accepted and, and the audience was so engaged yes. with everybody. Yeah. In your, uh, I know you, 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 you left Somalia when you were four years old. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, take us to the point where you said poetry is, is a thing. Fit poetry is uh, the something uh, that I want to do, and that's something I find my identity in. So, yeah, we're often Somalis are called the nation of poets, and so there is an element to the language that is very poetic. Many times my parents would speak in metaphors or they would regularly use proverbs from Somalia. Many times that would engage the natural landscape, uh, the ocean specifically, and so even the act of trying to translate that into English was a poetic gesture. And the things that I was most interested in, the way that I felt that I had the strongest control over my story and of language was in poetry, and so I continued to do that. Um, and it and and also sometimes yeah. sometimes people when they live in a diaspora, when they live in a different, I'm not saying hostile culture or hostile mainstream culture, you want to find your niche. You want to yes. find something that the other don't have it. Yes. And I think sometimes when you are a poet, that's, that, that stand out and you can defend yourself uh, with, uh, with that metaphoric and uh, that kind of scale. Uh, t tell us a little bit of, and I know you, you recite one of the one of the poem that you recite, and I was just amazed. I was just mind boggling, blowing by this, and I can relate to it. Okay. And it was brilliantly done. His idea is so simple, but it was brilliantly done. That you just took a conversation that, or how mothers uh, curse their kids, or I didn't say mother, it was an adult, whatever conversation. But you call it curses, yes. And you just translate it to English, and uh, and and it, it was just I've heard this before, you know. Any any child in, in, in our part of the world hear these things, and and you know, uh, the mother didn't mean that. And, yes. And, um, 
So tell us a little bit about the story of the curse, as I know you probably have a different take on it. Well, yeah, so the poem um, Invocation that is in the book, uh, it works primarily off of the Somali tradition of inkaring or curses, so invoking. Um, and it is something that people try to be careful with because you don't genuinely want to hurt someone's feelings, especially your own child, but the language is incredibly rich. And it's almost because the curses are so fantastic, some of them can't even happen, which is yeah. why a person would make it, you know, as a way yeah. of releasing a kind of frustration, or sometimes it's done totally in jest. Uh, it's just humor, a source of humor. And so I, that engagement with language, even at a moment where you're very, very frustrated or because you want a moment of comedic relief, whether you're frustrated or not, uh, was very appealing to me. And so I was just listening uh, my mother would make them sometimes, although she's very careful to not direct them at us in particular ways. Yeah. And I wondered what some of them would sound like in English. Um, and so some of them are direct translations and some of them are lines that are just invented to connect the curses yes, I, to each I, other. I so, <laughs> so I was interested in what happens when you have all these feelings that are just bottled up and you want to expel. Um, even if that's not a totally positive gesture. But, but there is like a, an agreed on role, you know, like yes. uh, the other person understand. Yes, and the other person understands and may even repeat exactly. the, a curse or do a yeah. much worse curse, <laughs> exactly. actually. Yeah. So, yeah. A way the roles that, are set. Yes, exactly. It's, it's a kind of, it's an exchange. exchange. And an exchange that is interested in wordplay, but I think in a very real way, especially for women in the diaspora, there's pressure, mm -hmm. you know, a very serious pressure from the outside world that sometimes reflects the pressure that is internal. And I wanted something in the book that would release that a little bit. <laughs> and it's my pleasure sometimes when people repeat some of the lines yeah. um, to me. And several people bought the book because they wanted to have those curses compiled. <laughs> in, I did. In, so can you tell us a little bit about this poem and maybe recite some of it? Yes, so the poem Amber Doll appears towards the, is in the last section of the book. And that whole section deals with um, imagined spaces or fantastic or dream figures. And so this poem is similar. We were having a conversation earlier about the ways that it's similar to invocation, but the voice is a little bit unclear. And the speaker is concerned with tamping down or somehow making this doll immobile because the doll itself is a symbol for silence and being silenced, of being unable, of not being free in the world, and even of poverty. And mm -hmm. so... Emotionalness. Yeah, and so there's all these... What I hope to communicate is that there is an interest in stopping something that is a limitation and stopping... Uh, an inclination to see yourself reflected in a helpless or hapless figure mm -hmm. um, and making something new, something fantastic. How can we transcend? How can we rise out of something that feels like a limitation? Okay, so yeah, you, yes. here is you, you're kind of dismantling how people look at dolls, to be honest with you. Yes, you okay. Of, <laughs> you kind of put a, a different relationship. You never look at this a doll the same way again once you, you hear this. I gutted you 10 years ago, cut your limbs with a kitchen knife, and threw you in a dumpster across the street. I watched the three-legged cat grieve you, head in his paws. Amber, you dull-eyed monster, how did you find me? You did not scream when I sliced the seam of your spine. You stared. You smiled your dry lip smile. It was not me who colored you purple. I did not keep you under the stairs. But we never put rollers in your hair. You are not even good enough for brown bear who the paper dolls would not give the time of day. We could have let you marry him. You are an ugly girl in a paisley dress got from a bin at the Salvation Army. Your eyes roll white in their sockets, even though you're cheap, and your eyes don't move when you're made to dance, when a little sister is playing baby and rocking you in her arms.
What's amber to you? For me, amber was a symbol. So she represents an actual doll that my sisters and myself had when we were little. And so we had all these different toys and we built a, it was mostly my younger sisters, but they would let me participate sometimes. We built, uh, there's a toy town that they had made. And so Amber Doll was this kind of unattractive doll that wasn't put together very well. And there was just something about her that was creepy. And so when I was thinking about what has to be shed, what has to be left by the end of this book so the speaker can transcend, what has to be destroyed, Amber Doll was a figure that would make sense in this strange space, in this dream space. And I wondered what would happen if a person, if something that you had discarded many years ago that you never liked in the first place, <laughs> if it just came to your porch or you suddenly saw it on top of your fridge, how annoying would it be? And what would the response be? Um, and so, and it was powerful for me to be able to allow the speaker to say, I won't believe in you, you're dead. And so I think there are many things just even in our internal landscape, we have to put it away. We have to find a way to kill it and move past it. And so. What's interesting, I mean, doll is dead to begin with. Yes. And then you're telling a exactly. dead doll, you are dead. Yes. <laughs> you <did> twice. <laughs> yeah, you're not living in the first place. But there's a way I think that you can feel like that when as a displaced person. Um, and sometimes as a woman, the, not personally the bigness that you have inside yourself, but what the way that the world tries to limit you and mm -hmm. what it tries to do to you, there is that tension. It's actually when you, when, you, when you understand that and accept it. I mean, people outside of that relationship yes. is, oh my goodness, it's a vicious <laughs> well, it's relationship. A, yes. But I think the doll understand what you're talking about. Yeah, that's like a, you have a history being, uh, between both of you. Yeah, that's a really lovely interpretation because the speaker is presumably is more of an adult, right? Not really yeah. a child anymore. Yeah. And so there is something in that even, right? This is an act of grace to allow, to assume that a doll is able, that sense of animation, even if for the time we were playing with you, that you were alive and had a sense of story. And that's what I wanted for almost every image of in the book, I wanted it to have a story to, if you looked at it, it could suddenly just start speaking. Even if you're looking at a cup, that maybe the cup has a right to give a testimony and bear witness to its sure. life and mm -hmm. think that everything is worth regarding. And so I'm glad that, you're, that you see that. Actually, it really pleases me that you see that. <laughs> Get a hold of it. So the book is called The Kitchen Dweller's Testimony. Um, it is printed by the University of Nebraska Press. Its official release date was April 1st. And so April you can... April Yes. <laughs> I was a little... I questioned that That's for a moment. That's beautiful. <laughs> that is boring. Uh, yes. So it was available a bit early, but That's so you can find it on the University of Nebraska Press's site. You can also find it um, on Amazon if folks are attending the AWP Writers Conference at the Convention Center over the next couple of days. It is available at the book fair there. And... So the book is a, it's all poems, it's a collection of poems, it's my first book. A lot of uh, poet there. Yes. Uh, Ladin Osman, she had, uh, you know, uh, a new book, uh, The Kitchen Dweller, right? Yes. And it's available in the market, and uh, she is a Somali-American, and they talk using poetry as a way of telling her story, her country story. <laughs>